My guest today, uh, Naveen Jain. Uh, Naveen is a contributor at Tari Labs, and yet, and my other guest is uh, Ricardo Fluffy Pony Spagni. Ricardo, of course, is a member of the Monero team and also a contributor at uh, Tari Labs. Uh, welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you yeah, for having us. Glad to be here. Thank, thank you for having us. Let's just do what we do at the beginning of the show. Um, we'll go to you each in turn. Just love to hear a, a, a little bit of a, a quick intro and background. Uh, let's start with you, Naveen. Um, yeah, please go for gold. Just uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Naveen. Uh, I am a you know serial entrepreneur. I love building things both in the crypto space and in the music music industry. Um, originally from California, and really excited to be here with you all today. Excellent. And Ricardo, welcome. Uh, same thing. Yeah, um, I'm also a serial entrepreneur, built a bunch of things uh, over the last 15 years or so. Um, I started with Bitcoin in early 2011 uh, and uh, have built a bunch of things along the way. And as you alluded to, I guess I'm most famous for uh, being Monero's core maintainer from its outset till 2019 when I stepped back to build more stuff. Sure. And I think that's probably a, a nice way in because funnily enough, Monero is a part of the Tari story, I, I suppose. But And, and strangely, I, I know both of you guys, Naveen and Ricardo, Tari is not a new project. Uh, it has been bubbling away in the background for some time, uh, but I, go, I guess about to hit prime time. So I don't know, Ricardo, do you, do you want to kind of kick off and just give a, a little bit of background to, to what Tari is and the kind of, I guess the origin story would be, would be good. Yeah, so you know, great question. I think one of the the things that uh, that is useful as background information is Monero is of course heavily privacy focused. In fact, it aims to be maximally private. Uh, the challenge with that is the minute you have any sort of metadata and transactions, you end up leaking information. So you know, if you had to build something um, like colored coins or uh, ordinals into Monero that extra metadata is really dangerous because it could reveal connections between transactions that would otherwise not be revealed. So in the past, we've spoken about like, could we build some sort of like, you know, digital asset system on Monero? And that was like the gem of the idea. In rejecting that idea for Monero, we sort of thought, um, you know, like, like what are our options? Um, and so Tari is a um, hybrid merge mind uh, a side chain for Monero. Um, so it's a side chain in the sense that there's hybrid merge mining and uh, that we're building an atomic swap system between the two. And those are the primary sort of primary sort of connections. But it, it goes a little bit deeper than that because there's so many things that that we think are really beautiful um, that the Monero community does so well. Um, you know, it's not just like being passionate about Monero itself, but you know, the fact that there's like traditions like skepticism sundays where every sunday there's a thread on the subreddit where the monero community uh, is skeptical talks about monero's failures and why it's just doomed to not succeed and that sort of pragmatism and realism is something that um is not a there's not a technical thing you know you don't put that in the code it's just something that we think is culturally significant and important and we want to have carry over to tari so i think the connection is you know not just like a technical connection, which there is, and, you know, a shared sort of like um, origin. But more than that, it's uh, really about like having a similar culture to Monero in a, a chain that is digital assets focused. Yeah, very, very well said. Thank you for that. Uh, it'd be useful also just to understand, I guess, uh, the nature of Tari. Like, I, I guess, like any blockchain, it is a, a decentralized protocol. Uh, there's not necessarily any leader, but certainly there are core contributors. And I think, you know, you both describe yourself as, as core contributors. And I think you've both been there from the beginning. So, uh, Naveen, do you want to just jump in and maybe explain, uh, yeah, the roles that, that you guys have and, and what you've been doing and, yeah, how, how the project is being steered? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, I think our roles as contributors to Tari are just to create energy around Tari, you know, so how do we uh, educate people about Tari and give, let them know 
you know, what are some of the capabilities and unique attributes that Tari has versus perhaps other things, why Tari is really, really important, both in terms of, you know, enabling people to build awesome applications on top of Tari, but also because Tari has some, you know, very interesting uh, confidentiality oriented features and capabilities that really unlock new use cases that you really don't get uh, to play with, uh, with other protocols. And also just to like, you know, be be a part of the community and be there for the community. Um, but, you know, Tari is, as you said, leaderless. It's been open source since day one. Um, and, you know, we're really excited to see what people choose to build on top of it. And look, gentlemen, just to be frank, maybe Ricardo, this is one for you, but why why has it taken so long? Um, if, if that makes sense, you know, because we've seen you kind of talk about it on and off for a number of years, um, but now we're we're ready to roll it. Has it just been kind of a, a passion project or now is the right time? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I think one of the things that I said right at the beginning when we started down this road is that hard things are hard. Um, building something like this is something that, that shouldn't be rushed. And we've seen we see this a lot actually um, in this space. You know, we see projects rush out the gate, and they have to make incredible compromises. You know, they they have to make compromises that they then can't actually fix later on. They can't switch to a more decentralized model, at least not easily. And oftentimes, when they do switch to a more decentralized model, there's all this legacy stuff that like comes along with them. So we saw the way we sort of think of it is um, there's two extremes on the one extreme uh, or the one side of things you've got like a fully baked project it is perfect it is like ready to go you know it can be fully decentralized like it's just it's immaculate and on the other end you've got like what i can only describe as a science project and what we're finding finding is that the innovative stuff in the space because there's not much of it but the innovative stuff in the space gets launched when it's in like science project mode and and when i'm not going to sit here and say like you should be fully baked before you launch. You know, you also need to be live so that you can like iterate and test and um, receive feedback from a live protocol because testnet is not it. You know, no one's attacking testnet when there's no where there's no real money on the line um, and there's no real like users on the line. And so there really is this like the shift between the two. Um, and we 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 sort of like rejected the idea of just like launching as a science project. And I'm glad we did because over the past like six years, everything that we initially decided uh, from a technical perspective, bar one or two major things like architecting it in Rust and using Mumble Wimble, um, like all the other stuff, all the ideas we had, like are they're so out the window. Like they're so they would have they would have been insane amounts of technical debt. So I'm really glad that we like try to really just like iterate, build, test, experiment. And then get to a point where we're like, cool, we've actually got something real tangible um, that we can launch with. Um, and now we're at a point where uh, the project feels like it's um, almost ready to launch, uh, at least the L1. And we've got like, you know, um, a, a proper path and a proper architecture for the L2. Um, you know, we've built experimental stuff that uh, we, you know, have now thrown away. Um, and uh those the lessons from that have been invaluable. There's just no way to to do it with you know any other way. And I see time and time again projects that do it other any uh, some other way, and they end up with like having to put the most complicated systems in place to move from like V1 to V2. People lose money. People forget that they need to migrate. It's a whole mess, and we just didn't want to have that happen. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Very well said again. Look, gentlemen, there's a lot to understand about Tari. There's there are you know there are several really interesting components. There's the the mining side of things. Uh, there's the Monero merge mining connection. Uh, you talk about how you're building a Tari for creators, so they have a really you know unique kind of level of control over their assets to create what you call beautiful user experiences. We certainly need more of those. Um, and crypto, of course, the privacy angle is huge as well. Look, we'll come back to that. But another, uh, you alluded to it as well, Ricardo, but let's, we'll get Naveen's take on it first. Launching a new blockchain and what do you do with, you know, the, the assets or the tokens? Is there a pre-mine? Do you allocate tokens to founders or investors? These are, you know, really uh, kind of interesting questions, of course, and, and crypto. No one can ever beat the kind of the, 
um, you know, profound birth of, of Bitcoin, but we can get close, right? And I think you guys uh, have an interesting way of launching, I think, the Tari protocol. So maybe, Naveen, do you want to jump in and, and talk about the philosophy behind that and, and how you want to do it in a, in a fair way, I guess? Yeah, so I think that there's many trade-offs that people have to think about when they're designing these kinds of systems. And when we think about um, you know, what it means to build something that's permissionless and you know, what it means to build something that is accessible, um, you know, we think that there isn't anything better um, for a layer one than proof of work. Um, and the reason why is because if you think about how this is, how the industry has evolved over the last several years, you know the more, majority of new systems that are launching these days are some form of proof of stake system. And in a proof of stake system, you have this concept of a token generation event. You know you have essentially a scenario where there's you know someone, some developer out there who's pushing pushing a button. Uh, and a bunch of tokens now exist. And then they inevitably try to their very best to distribute them, right? And they're distributing them to many different, um, you know, many different constituents, you know, whether it's sure team investors, uh, you know, people who are, who are, you know, participating in the test net or whatever it is. Um, and, and there's many challenges there, right? That's why the majority of proof of stake protocol launches are effectively civil attacked, you know, right? Like people essentially farm the airdrop because there really are only three ways to acquire a proof of stake token, right? So you can be an early investor in a, in a protocol or a project, you can you know farm the airdrop, or you can buy tokens from somebody else. And those are the only three ways to acquire a proof of stake token. Uh, for Tari, uh, we felt, you know, and the community felt that it was very, very important to enable people to come into the network from essentially a, a cold start. You know, so uh, Tari, is, is proof of work at the L1 level. It's hybrid merge mine with Monero, as we've discussed. And one of the things that we get from merge mining with Monero is the fact that Monero uses RandomX as a hashing algorithm. And RandomX is really kind of a remarkable thing because it has a, a certain amount of ASIC resistance, right? So the idea is that anyone can post up and begin to mine Monero with a CPU. You. And as a result, anyone can post up and start to mine Tari uh, with the CPU. And that's really, really cool, right? Like you could hear about Tari three years from now or five years from now or whenever Tari launches and, you know, just post up with your existing hardware and start to mine and start to contribute to the security model of the network and also start to be rewarded with tokens. And so we think that's like a really remarkable and compelling thing. It's not obviously not a new idea, right? Like this is like a well-worn idea. Um, it's the original idea, if you will. Um, but it is an idea that we think is worth coming back to. And so, you know, in the in the case of Tari, you know, like the vast, vast, vast majority of tokens are just going to be mined by miners um, who are providing security to the network and enabling people to build secure applications on top of the network. Yep, and uh, love to get uh, your thoughts on that uh, as well, Ricardo. And and talk about the, I guess the the issuance schedule, uh, of what that looks like in terms of uh, the mining rewards. And just again, so the idea here is that uh, it, it's kind of the democratization of mining that you know anyone uh, with a home computer who wants to join the network and contribute to the network, they should be able to do that, and they should be rewarded for doing so. Right, Ricardo. Yeah, exactly. I think um, something that's sort of um, top of mind for me is the, you know, Naveen spoke about like proof of stake protocols and the TGE and so on. Um, and it's so challenging because, you know, in, in anything, in anything, early adopters are rewarded. You know, if you discovered AI and started playing with LLMs and started training stuff, um, you might have launched an AI company and raised $100 million, you know, by now. Um, but that doesn't mean that discovering ChatGPT today doesn't make it super useful. It doesn't mean that discovering it today doesn't or like precludes you from launching a company. So early adopters are de facto rewarded. And the problem with proof of stake is like the the um, level of upfront reward is just egregious. And even if there's like lockups and whatever, it still ends up being a really small pool of people that are rewarded that way. 
So with the, the emission curve, we've tried to find an emission curve that's like, you know, um, somewhere between Bitcoins and Moneros. Um, it still has that sort of relatively steep initial um, lift. And that's really important because your earliest miners are the ones taking the most risk. You know, some of them are like buying dedicated hardware. Okay, you know, they're buying computers. It's not like they're buying ASICs, but still they're buying dedicated hardware. Um, you know, there's a, a like the, the CPU miner that's baked into Tatari, and we've seen this with every proof of work launch, like those miners end up um, being improved. And sometimes like they get improved really quickly. You know, the like there's next minute there's a GPU miner, next minute someone's programming an FPGA. The people that put in that effort like should be rewarded. And the only way they can be rewarded is by burning electricity and putting in energy and time and effort. Um, whereas with like, you know, being rewarded with a lot of proof of stake systems, it's like, cool, I have money. I bought a bunch of uh, tokens and I staked them. Uh, congrats, I guess. Like there's no room for improvement. There's no room for, you know, any sort of asymmetry. And that's unfair because there's there's uh, like everything um, in every business is asymmetrical. Every invention has an asymmetrical advantage to the creator, to the inventor. Um, and so, you know, like proof of work is just like, it's not even marginally more fair. It's just obviously more fair, um, you know, and closer to the way the real world works than, you know, proof of stake systems. And uh, Bitcoin, uh, 21 million coins. How, how many how many coins with Tari? Yeah, so um, oh, Naveen, do you, I was going to say this is a Naveen question. <laughs> okay. Well, so... Um, the way Tari works is there will be 21 billion Tari tokens yeah. emitted on a curve over um, approximately 27.8 years. Now, there's some really interesting elements here. Um, so, you know, Monero has this concept of a tail emission. And part of the reason why the tail emission exists for Monero is because there's a, still this sort of like grand question in the Bitcoin community of, well, what happens when the block reward trends to zero, right? Yeah. So that, that's sort of a, a question, an age old question that we keep kind of like coming back to in the Bitcoin community. Um, so the way that part of the way Monero has answered this question is Monero has this concept of a tail emission. So miners effectively are, are always going to be compensated with some amount of Monero. Um, Tari has a tail emission as well, but has sort of an added sort of dimension to it, which is sort of kind of very interesting. So Tari's tail emission is um, is a 1% uh, inflation rate. So basically, you, you actually reach that sort of like inflection point between core emissions and the ongoing 1% inflation rate somewhere around year 13 or so uh, post mainnet launch. But what's very, very interesting is Tari implements the concept of a turbine model because you got to remember Tari has a layer two um, and the, a native layer two. And the layer two is where all the digital asset issuance actually occurs. So the way the system sort of works at a very high level is you mine layer one tokens, you burn them for layer two tokens, and then as you conduct transactions on the layer two, a small amount of the layer two tokens are burned with every transaction. So you have what effectively becomes a soft peg uh, between the layer one tokens and the layer two tokens, and you reach sort of effectively closer to an equilibrium. So the idea is that Tari will always have some amount of relatively nominal inflation rate um, associated with the system, but as the layer two becomes increasingly successful and there's more and more and more transactions on the layer two, um, you have sort of a deeper level of equilibrium between in terms of the overall supply of tokens. So, um, so that at a very high level is how Tari works. It's very unique again because um, we're we're we have sort of this the community has this sort of broader ambition of building a full blown smart contracting platform, right? Where you can you can build a wide range of different types of DApps. It's fully Turing complete at the layer two level. Um, and so there's lots of unique possibilities, but we need to strike a balance between um, the miner community and making sure the miner community is effectively rewarded, making sure the tokenomics makes sense to people. So people feel like there's, you know, sort of like value ultimately accruing to Tari tokens from the overall ecosystem um, that is sort of exists around Tari. And at the same time, make sure that we're providing adequate security um, for, for the layer two. So there's, there's sort of a lot of different things to think about. There. And that's part of the reason why it took six long years. Yep, it's uh, it's starting to uh, starting to make sense, uh, gentlemen. Yep, look, let's bring it back to the privacy component. Of course, you know Monero, the I guess the number one privacy coin. But look, 
let's be honest, you know, the, the privacy narrative is a tough one in crypto. And I think it was just two days ago, Binance effectively delisted Monero, no doubt, you know, pressure from the regulators or, or whoever, you know, it's, a, it's just a common story with centralized exchanges. Um, if the regulators don't want privacy coins, they can apply pressure. Now, I, I know there is, um, you guys talk about, I, I think, composable privacy is one way I've, I've heard Tari described, which is a really, yeah, fascinating uh, concept. So, um, look, Ricardo, you're, you're the privacy guy, so we'll go back to you. But um, uh, look, tackle this any, any way you want. But the, yeah, the, the Tari philosophy with privacy, what composable privacy means, what does it mean for the future in terms of being potentially available on centralized exchanges and that kind of back and forward tug of war between technology, innovation, regulation, big, big questions, importance of privacy, Ricardo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so look, I, I think one of the things that occurs to me is um, I don't know how we got here. Well, I got, I've got a vague idea, but like the fact that we have not normalized privacy in the crypto space is wild to me. Mm -hmm. Privacy is normalized in the medical industry, in banking. Privacy is normalized in business. Privacy is normalized in messaging. Every messaging platform has like push to go e to e e you know like twitter is putting privacy in their dm system like the fact that that in crypto we go oh, pri oh no we don't want privacy that it's wild it's absolutely wild to me it's not the way the world works so we think normalizing confidentiality is super important and you know whatever you want to call it composable confidentiality you know programmable privacy like it's all the same the same idea and the idea is very simply that it should never be up to the user to figure out how a system should work. Because again, it's not the way the world works. If you decide to build and launch a messaging app today, your users don't say, oh, I'll, you know, I'll use a like some third party tool to mix my messages, to encrypt my messages. They're not using GPG to encrypt messages on Telegram. You know, they're just going, oh, I'm not going to use Telegram for anything sensitive. I'm using Signal. You know, like, and there's a reason for that. It's because the software developer, the creator, the inventor, the operator, those are the ones that go, this is how much privacy we can put in. You know, we, these are the limits. These are, you know, like, uh, and, and my, my favorite story of uh, recent times with this is the UK saying they need a backdoor into encrypted messaging and like Meta who, you know, runs WhatsApp and Signal saying, you, you're welcome to, but then we're just going to like pull out of the UK. Like we will literally not operate in the UK at all. Like, let's go. Let, let's, you want to you wanna box? Let's go. And I think that that's the way that we should be acting. We should be saying like, we're putting reasonable privacy in. And if um, we can't operate uh, this particular DAP or whatever it is in a country because they're against that, against freedom, against you know, people being able to think for themselves and make basic choices, well, then we just won't operate there. And the only way to do that is through um, like some sort of composability or program programmability when it comes to the actual um, privacy mechanism, you know? And so like the original idea um, that we envisioned was something akin to like privacy sliders, you know, like, like yeah, it's maximally, pri maximally private or it's minimally private when it comes to like, you know, um, the transaction graph or, you know, like where's the slider when it comes to like transaction amounts being visible? Like, are they visible to everyone? Are they, you know, partially visible? You have to be part of some committee or are they not visible at all? Like, you know, these are also different states that, uh, that you can set. And not only should you be able to set that at the beginning, but you should be able to change it later on through, you know, some sort of upgrade. And of course, I mean, you can throw away the keys to like not upgrade, um, but at the end of the day, again, it's up to the issuer. It's up to the operator. It's not up to the user. Um, the operator knows where they're based, how they're regulated, what licenses they, they get and whatever. And the operator should be able to respond to changing regulations. So if the regulation changes and they can make the system more private, they should, which is exactly what happens in real life. Over time, Facebook's been able to improve privacy. They've been able to add messaging to, uh, or Meta's been able to add it to Facebook. Um, where, you know, I mean, Facebook had a very bad privacy wrap for a very long time, and now they're actually like trying to do something, um, you know, maybe not for advertisers, but at least for individual users. 
Um, and I think that that's, that's, again, something that should be applauded, something that should be leaned into and something that needs to be um, a norm in the crypto space where right now, as you pointed out to, it seems to be this like weird path to follow. Yeah, it is a uh, it is a weird one, and you know what what's the status of of Monero based on uh, you know what what Binance did? I think uh, Monero is still on Kraken and in, in the US, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually a great question. Like my my sort of um, uh, intuition here is that Binance has dealt with a very very um, big case with the Department of Justice. The Department yeah. of Justice is now very embedded in Binance. You know, not a bad thing. I'm not going to argue. You know, like legality or morality of it. Like, you know, if that's uh, if that if that is if finance was facilitating crime and this is the the consequence. Um, okay, there are second order effects, and uh, those will will um sort of reveal themselves over time. And I think some of those second and third order effects will be net negative, especially for um Southeast Asia and you know places where finance like was the so dominant that it was like the only way to to operate but i think when you look at it from like a us perspective and like an eu perspective tons of exchanges in the eu have no problem with monero um you know uh, obviously kraken in the us is a massive monero champion um and that's that's huge because like if anyone's being regulated it's kraken you know if anyone's like under a spotlight it's kraken um, and the fact that they still have no problem listing Monero means that this is less of an overall like regulatory pushback against Monero and more of, you know, a handful of exchanges, um, Binance in particular, over complying out of fear. And that's fine. Not, ev not everyone's going to be brave enough to stand up and be like Apple and be like Meta and be like Twitter and say, like, we will not move. Yeah, yeah, and look, just just to finish up on on the privacy angle, I suppose, uh, Naveen, look, you know, love to get your perspective. Obviously, um, you know, one of your core contributors in the project is Ricardo from Monero. Uh, your merge mining Tari with Monero, so you've kind of planted your flag with Monero and effectively as uh, as a privacy coin. You know, just to, to I guess use that phrase. Is is that a narrative? Um, that will be, um, yeah, I guess something that, that Tari will lead with. So first of all, I, I don't think there's a better project to, to be associated with in the industry. I mean, Monero has a very vibrant community, has a very sort of deep focus. It, it, it knows what it is. Um, and, you know, the community is deeply passionate um, about, about the protocol. I think the work that Ricardo has done in that community is, uh, is incredible. And so, frankly, I'm very, very lucky to have the opportunity to contribute to Tari and, you know, work alongside Ricardo and other contributors, uh, you know, on the Tari protocol. As it relates to this privacy coin narrative, I think that um, it's kind of a broken narrative, in my opinion, because <clears throat> as Ricardo mentioned, you know, when you think about traditional finance and you think about how money moves around the world, um, the tens of trillions of dollars that swirl around the world every single day today uh, largely move in a default confidential way peer to peer, right? So if I send you a wire transfer, for example, you know, who knows that I sent you the wire transfer? Well, obviously the banks do, uh, but nobody else does. Um, you know, if you use a payment app, for example, like a cash app, you know, who knows that you used a cash app to send money to somebody. If you swipe a credit card, um, you know, who knows that you swipe that credit card. And again, it's not about perfect privacy. It's about the fact that on a peer to peer basis, these transactions are default confidential. When you think about business, you know, business is a really important thing to talk about here. You know, when I walk into a retail shop uh, where I live, you know, um, I don't know what the cost of goods is what, you know, for every single product. I don't know how much they paid the factory, how much they paid for shipping, how much they paid for taxes and duties. What's the markup from the retailer? Um, you know, there's a reason why all of these sorts of things are fairly well obfuscated from users. When you think about a B2B business, you know, there's no B2B business on the planet 
planet that wants customer A to know what customer B is paying um, because you may want to charge different prices to different customers. It may be a different scope of work. It may be a different scale. It may just be a different opportunity or a different time. Um, when you think about payroll, you know, no employer in the world wants every employee to know how much other employees are getting paid. When you think about art, you know, most buyers of art at Sotheby's or Christie's buy anonymously, you know, and it's not because they have something to hide. It's not because they're rampant criminals. Um, it's because that, largely speaking, the movement of money around the world is default confidential. So, again, as Ricardo mentioned in the crypto space, we've done this very silly thing, which is we've effectively criminalized privacy. You know, we've said that privacy doesn't matter. And that privacy is um, is something that is associated with criminality, and we've kind of bought into this narrative um, because some very vocal regulators and vocal um, lawmakers have have made it a narrative. But the hard reality is, is that it's actually a psyop. That's what's funny about it. It's actually a psyop because it's a way of constraining crypto, right? So if you have a lawmaker and a regulator saying privacy is bad, privacy is bad. Privacy is bad, but then in the real world, you actually need confidentiality in order for business to work and in order for something to scale. It, it works to keep the crypto industry down, right? It works to keep us all sort of in a box. There's this really funny box that's been created around confidentiality. And I think the key here is to be pragmatic. So, you know, Ricardo is the one who in, came up with this concept of privacy sliders. And the first moment he shared this idea, I, I was kind of blown away by the concept because really what he's saying is instead of treating confidentiality as a binary outcome, treat it as a spectrum. Um, so the protocol is apolitical. The protocol is default confidential peer to peer, just like the the existing financial system is, you know, the TradFi system that we're all trying to, you know, trying to innovate against and, and push against and, and build, you know, something greater and bigger. But at the end of the day, it's about the developers and what a developer wants to do on the system. And a developer, if, if someone wants to issue a fiat backed stable coin on Tari and have full visibility into the transaction graph for their token and the ability to mint tokens and BERT tokens and, and freeze funds and do all kinds of things that they need to do to comply with whatever regulatory regime that they need to comply with, they can do that. Just like with HTTP, right? HTTP doesn't care about compliance, doesn't care about... Uh, regulation. It's about the website developer. So that's why when you visit the EU and you load up a website, you have all these privacy and you know cookie boxes that pop up. Um, it's because it's part of the regulatory landscape in the European Union. You don't necessarily have that in the United States. There's many different types of content that you're not allowed to have on websites on a global basis because we've deemed it to be illegal. We've deemed it to be bad for society, and that's perfectly fine. But it's not about HTTP as the protocol complying with those regulations. It's about enabling and empowering developers to comply. And that's exactly the mindset for Tari. And that's part of what makes Tari, I think, fun fundamentally different and unique from the majority of other protocols out there. Oh, that was well said, Naveen. Thank you so much for that. And look, you know, shout out to uh, the Monero devs. You know, my uh, my Telegram avatar was uh, the Monero, Monero logo for like years uh, back in the day. But um, yeah, I think you put the nail on the head when you said, you know, it's the it's the state uh, putting their finger on the scales to try and hold crypto down is is exactly what they're doing with you know when they come down on on privacy coins. But look, let's keep it moving gentlemen I, I talked about earlier um how you talk about creating tari for creators and uh beautiful user experiences being able to issue uh, all sorts of different digital assets you know tickets loyalty points nfts i guess um I don't, yeah, just curious as to how you guys envision this part of the protocol and, and yeah, the kind of uh, opportunities you want to unlock. Well, you know, the, the protocol is, uh, is capable of many things, right? So there's a, this concept of a Turing complete VM, um, you know, developers can build templates, um, those templates. Uh, are composable. So we have this whole idea from a developer experience point of view of over time making it easier and easier and easier for developers to build really remarkable things on top of Tari. Um, we think that creating uh, strong traditions around user experience and creating the right kind of user experience patterns 
um, has tremendous value to the target community. Um, and whether it's someone who wants to build some sort of an NFT marketplace or, you know, drop NFTs, or whether it's someone who wants to build a DEX, you know, some sort of a DeFi application, um, all of that is possible on Tari. So we're not here to constrain how people uh, use Tari. I think, you know, yes, on the Tari website, um, there's talk about digital assets and things like um, tokenized tickets and tokenized loyalty points and tokenized art. Um, but to be very clear, um, the types of use cases that are really remarkable um, for Tari are, are those use cases and so much more. So for example, when you think about uh, programmable confidentiality um, and you think about you know the kinds of things you can do with it, it's like, okay, well, in the DeFi universe, that means you can have DeFi without MEV, right? Because if, if a transaction going into the mempool, if you don't know uh, what that transaction is going into the mempool because of the confidentiality features, how can you front run the transaction, right? That's really interesting. That's really interesting. That creates a, a, a stronger degree of fairness around DeFi. Right now, whenever you visit a DEX on you know most other protocols and you change the slippage, you get this sort of nasty error message you know, that says, hey, user, FYI, you're about to be front run. Just wanted to let you know, proceed at your own risk, right? Um, but imagine a world where that's not really happening. Or imagine a world where if someone is a hardcore trader and today they have hundreds of wallets because they're trying their best in a default transparent universe, they're doing their best to obfuscate their transactions. They don't want people copy trading their wallets. They don't want people following the movement of money and the things that they're doing and the alpha that they have, whatever that alpha may be. Imagine a world where on Tari, you can just have a single trading wallet. You don't need to play this game and 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 invest the amount of time and effort and friction um, because you're just trying to hide in the crowd, right? Like that's another example of something that's really remarkable on Tari um, because you have this concept of programmable confidentiality. Um, imagine in the payment space, you know, we, we talked about payments for a very long time in the crypto space and it's really sort of only taken off with things like USDT on Tri on in sort of like certain regions of the world. It's not really like kind of broadly taken off. Well, why is that? Well, the reason why is because if you don't have confidentiality around the movement of money for payments, you don't have a payment system. You just don't, right? So now you have this concept of like, oh, someone, I just mentioned an example of someone being able to issue a, a fiat back stable coin on Tari that's still fully compliant with local regulation, but it's default confidential peer to peer. Well, gosh, now all of a sudden you can use it for payroll. You can use it to democratize the time value of money. Oh, you're you're an hourly worker and you're getting paid every week or every two weeks. And you know, if you if your car breaks down and in, in between payroll cycles or your child gets sick, now you're screwed. You have to go to get an expensive payday loan. Oh, well, someone could come along using Tari and create a world where now that hourly worker is getting paid every minute. And the employer doesn't have to worry about every employee knowing how, how much other employees are getting paid. It's like things like that are really, really, really interesting, really compelling use cases for something like Tari, where objectively you can't use other protocols to build those kinds of things. So yes, we're very excited about digital assets of all kinds, stuff you mentioned like, like tokenized tickets and tokenized loyalty points and tokenized art. We're very, and tokenized art, you know, name a collector that wants everyone to know every single thing that they have. That doesn't exist. Most people who are collectors curate the information in terms of what they collect. Most art collectors, they don't reveal their entire art collection to the world. That's kind of crazy. But in, in the crypto space, we've normalized that, which is odd and is not how the rest of the world works. And when you speak about user experience and beautiful user experience, part of the way to think about that is meeting users where they are. So what do users expect around the movement of value systems in the world today? It becomes very hard to build a beautiful user experience if you're trying to change too many, uh, too many behaviors for the user. That's very difficult to do. So you have to be very careful about what behaviors we're trying to shift and mold and meld. And in crypto, we have this, this problem where we're just trying to change too many at once. And that's why the user experiences tend to be very tortured. So there's a lot of things to talk about here, but that's some of the philosophy and, and thinking behind something like Tari. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Uh, some some great points in there. And I think it, it just comes down to, you know, it's 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 a little bit, it's one of those paradoxes of blockchain that, you know, you have a kind of pseudo-anonymous uh, distributed unstoppable ledger, 
uh, decentralized. But, uh, you know, as soon as you get someone's Ethereum address, then, you know, uh, it's a little bit game over and the privacy is gone. And, you know, you, you just can't build the future of finance on, on a system like that. We do need, um, yeah, levels of privacy, composable privacy, programmable privacy, whatever you want to call it. Look, you know, as we start to finish off, a uh, gentleman, uh, I mean, there's there's more to talk about, but um, love to understand some timelines, uh, I guess. Where are we at in terms of what happens next? You know, when do, when can people start mining? Um, how can people uh, get involved? What's the best way for them to get involved? It's, you know, it feels like the timing is right. It's, you know, it's an, an exciting time uh, in crypto at the moment. Lots of, uh, lots of attention, um, people coming back to the market. Um, liquidity is starting to increase. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a great time um, to, yeah, get, get something like Tari um, out into the wild, I imagine. Yeah, so you know, I think uh, um, anyone who wants to get involved, uh, we have a test net that's live um, that you can go play with. Um, you can download the Tari Aurora wallets in the App Store and uh, get going on test net immediately. Um, uh, you know, beyond that, it's an open source project. Like pitch up, contribute. It's uh, written in Rust. Um, you know, there's uh, a, a bunch of really good technical documentation on rfc.tari.com. Um, you can read the RFCs, familiarize yourself with uh, the the underlying um, protocol and tech, um, and then contribute. You know, um, if you've got an idea, well, the RFCs are public too, are open source, so you can also like pitch up and be like, oh, yes, and you know, yes, a, a an improvement, whether it's cryptographic in nature or something else, or even just creating a spelling error. Um, you know, these are all improvements you can make. Um, and, and then beyond that, you know, being part of the community is super important. Um, you know, uh, you can start mining on testnet if you want to like, you know, start prepping for, for mining. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're currently, we've just, uh, uh, wrapped up, um, an audit of, uh, the Tari code base. Um, and what happens next, you know, like the community is, um, pushing, uh, and working towards, um, that mainnet launch um and uh you know we're all collaborating and supporting um each other in that uh, process and in that march towards uh towards mainnet awesome thank you so much ricardo uh yeah anything to add uh naveen as we finish off thank you so much for having us um you can follow us also on x uh we're at tari on x uh, so that's another place to follow the community and, and participate. And as Ricardo mentioned, if you want to start mining the testnet, you can do that. You can participate also on Telegram. Uh, there's also a Discord server for Tari. So lots of ways for people to engage and join in the fun. Um, and we are, you know, the community is very excited to bring Tari to the world in the very near future. Um, and as we like to say in the Tari community, soon. Tari is coming soon. All right. Well, thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, it has been a pleasure talking to you both today. Tari sounds uh, fascinating, fantastic. Like I said, it's a, it's a great time to bring uh, something like this uh, out into the world. So wish you nothing but the best. Uh, thank you very much and bye for now. Well, thanks thank you for having, having us. us. Bye. All right, there you go. That was uh, Ricardo and Naveen. Uh, from Tari. How good was that? Fantastic, fantastic discussion. Great to hear, yeah, what they've been building with Tari. And as I say, you know, they have been, you know, working on this for some time, but I think uh, we did get a bit of an insight into uh, why that is. Um, yeah, so thank you, gentlemen, for coming on the show. We reached the end of another show. Uh, please do make sure you subscribe to the Crypto Conversation in whatever podcast app you are using. Uh, but that is it for today, team. Thank you very much. I'll see you real soon. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave New Coin.